Great job. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Kendall Clement. I'm a postdoc in the labs of Luca Pinot and Keith Jung at Massachusetts General Hospital. And kind of the previous talk, uh, one of the questions that was asked is this, like these chimeric reads, reads which is actually going to uh, recur as a, a theme in this talk as well. So uh, I want to talk about, first of all, just to give a little bit of background about our, our, our system here, where we're going to be using CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing system. Next, I'll talk about our software we've developed called CRISPR Lungo, which is a pipeline for discovering and quantifying complex genome editing events. And then lastly, I'll show how we apply CRISPR Lungo to a case study of uh, genome editing outcomes from a two guide editing experiment. So first of all, a little bit of background about the CRISPR-Cas system. The CRISPR-Cas system is a valuable and powerful tool for making genomic changes. Um, briefly, there's a short, uh, let's see, uh, the, a short, um, guide RNA sequence shown here in white. And this encodes a sequence of homology about 20 base pairs long, as shown here in blue, to find uh, a target site in the genome uh, due to sequence homology. And then it targets a protein uh, nucleus called Cas9, which um, to, to that specific location in the genome. When, uh, when Cas9 finds its, its target, then it creates a double stranded break, uh, as shown here. And then this double stranded break is uh, healed or rejoined using a variety of processes. One of these is called non homologous end joining, which creates insertions and deletions at the cut site. Traditionally, these insertions, these small insertions and deletions, are read out using a process called amplicon sequencing. Two primers are designed to target either end of the target region. And then the inter intervening genomic sequence is, is uh, amplified using PCR amplification, which contains these insertions and deletions. These reads are then sequenced using traditional ne next generation Apicon sequencing, and then the resulting reads are analyzed for their small insertions and deletions. And this is really great. We're able to measure uh, the rates of these, uh, uh, the genome outcomes of, of CRISPR uh, Cas9 editing. However, these short insertions and deletions are not the only outcomes that can be produced by uh, genome editing. Instead, there can be a lot more complex genome editing outcomes, particularly if multiple sites are targeted in the genome. And this can, uh, so if there are multiple sites that, that experience, that have double stranded breaks, then they may be, uh, they may be joined together in unexpected ways. For example, if there are two, uh, for example, if, if two guides are used to target two specific, two separate sites in the genome, these can be joined. Or if there's an un unintended off target, an unexpected off target that uh, could be targeted by one of the guides, this could create multiple double stranded breaks that are, that are annealed in, or that are joined in unexpected ways. For example, these could include large inversions. So in this case, the, the genomic uh, sequence with A, B, C, and D is then disrupted by a rejoining of uh, this, the, the inversion of the intermediate sequence. So now we have A, C, B, D. Another possible genomic outcome is a large deletion, which is where this intervening sequence is completely deleted, or a translocation could happen between a target site on one chromosome and a target site on another chromosome. I want to point out here that although these sites are, or all these these um, these complex genome editing outcomes are relatively unpredictable, they can be harnessed by the experimental community. In the case, of, for example, if you'd like to completely delete a gene or an enhancer or a large genomic region, you can uh, you can do it with this approach. So these these aren't necessarily bad. They they can also be harnessed by the experimental community. However, these complex uh, outcomes cannot be uh, read out and are often overlooked and uh, by traditional uh, genome sequencing uh, methods. So standard amplicon sequencing relies on two primers which are used to amplify an, the internal genomic sequence. So for example, in this linear uh, location where sequence A is next to sequence B, uh, the primers are located or are, are, denoted, are denoted by these uh, half arrows here. And this linear sequence, this region can be amplified successfully. However, if there's a translocation or some kind of other chromosomal rearrangement event uh, happens, this, this region will not be uh, amplified and cannot be read. So if you're trying to analyze what the genome editing outcomes are, you would only see that this editing outcome is, is occurring and you would not be able to observe this. Uh, in order to address this, uh, technology has been developed called uh, single anchor or unidirectional amplicon sequencing. And in this, this strategy, one PCR primer is used to amplify genomic sequence starting at that site. So for example, a single primer could be used to amplify the sequence A, which would be, which would be able to de detect the linear uh, combination of A and B, as well as uh, the nonlinear combinations of A and D as well. 
however, the sequencing libraries produced by these single incremental sequencing uh, are, are relatively complex, mostly arising from the fact that there is no reference to which you can align these, these reads uh, that are in, the, especially in the nonlinear confirmation. Uh, but we would really like to, so it's, it's hard to be able to quantify predicted rearrangements. So if you know where the cut sites are, uh, you'd like to predict the rates at which those uh, predicted rearrangements are produced. However, you'd also like to be able to discover novel rearrangements. So if there's off targets in other places in the genome, you'd like to quantify those and discover those as well. In addition, another uh, wrinkle or another uh, unique thing about uh, unidirectional AMPCON sequencing is that the fragment size of every fragment is a different length, uh, whereas in paired or in standard amplicon sequencing, every fragment is approximately the same length. Unidirectional amplicon sequencing uh, produces fragments of, of different sizes, and there can be a PCR amplification bias uh, in the in the PCR amplification of each fragment. Uh, in addition, we'd like to, uh, in addition to large chromosomal rearrangements, we'd also uh, like to uh, identify and quantify small insertions and deletions at known sites in a similar way to the, the standard amplicon sequencing, except for, for these uh, larger chromosomal rearrangements. And lastly, the big challenge is how do you, if there's so many possible outcomes, how do you summarize and these complex events into easy, under, easy to understand reports? To address these uh, challenges, we've developed a, a pipeline called CRISPR-Lungo, which is a pipeline for dis discovering and quantifying complex genome editing events. As input for this pipeline, we're going to take sequencing reads in uh, single-end or paired-end format, as well as known cut size. So if a user uh, is, uh, uh, is using one or multiple guides, they will input the known cut size into this, this pipeline. CRISPR-Lungo then will perform its analysis and output the quantification of editing, uh, quantification of editing and uh, the large chromosomal rearrangements as well. CRISPR-Lungo operates or has, uh, performs five steps to do this analysis. The first step is that it will align uh, reads to the genomic reference sequence. And because mispriming is a common event or happens frequently when using uh, single, uh, single ink or amplicon sequencing, uh, there, there is a lot of off-target uh, mispriming as well. And so this first step helps remove off-target um, as well as linear amplification. The second step is for unaligned reads that do not align to the genome se sequence. We will create custom references from possible combinations of known uh, cut sites. So if a user knows they're, uh, if a user provides two cut sites, for example, we can, we can provide, we can create an art, a, a custom reference based on the known uh, uh, outcomes from possible uh, combinations of those sites as shown here. So for this cut site here, we, uh, we can create a, uh, the combinations between A and C, A, D, B, C, and D, D. And then we will align the remaining reads to these, uh, these custom references in a, using bowtie to an end end mode. This, uh, this is called, uh, this is a, a very biased analysis where we're basically only aligning reads to known uh, possible outcomes where the user kind of knows what uh, outcomes are expected. Um, however, there's still some, uh, some reads that are unaligned that we are not sure exactly where they're arising from. And for this, we performed an unbiased analysis. And so for this, we will split each read into short fragments and align these fragments of the genome. So here I have a, a read that is green and read, a read that is purple. And so we can see that for some, uh, this, this, this green read has some fragments of the, that are aligning to a particular region in the genome, uh, two particular regions in the genome, as well as the purple read. And then we will analyze these fragments for novel cut sites. And basically what we do is we have this algorithm where we uh, define, uh, the, we split the read into two partitions and minimize the number of novel uh, locations seen in each partition. And then we can, dis we can discover novel cut sites um, from, these, from these reads. After this, then we've, uh, we, we combined our knowledge of known cut sites as well as unknown cut sites, and we can create reference sequences uh, based on these known and novel cut sites. And we can align reads to these, um, these reference sequences and analyze them for small insertions and deletions using our tool CRISPRSO2, which we have uh, previously published. Basically, it aligns sequencing reads to, uh, to each reference uh, sequence using a CRISPR-aware aligner. Basically, because we know that we know where the, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 activity happens in a very small window, we can, um, prefer, uh, we can um, incentivize alignments where insertions and deletions are aligned to that particular location. 
And the second step that CRISPR also does is it quantifies insertions, mutations, and deletions. And then it, uh, the third step is it summarizes and edits the results, uh, or it summarizes the editing results in intuitive plots and data sets. Uh, we, when we combine our short indel information from Crispresso with the large um, chromosomal uh, uh, combination information from the alignment, we can. Um, the, this is our, our, our CRISPR Lungo pipeline. And so we can, from our in, input sequencing reads, we can quantify not only small indels using Crispresso, but also we can identify novel cut sites using our fragmentation uh, strategy. In addition, we can uh, quantify, use this to quantify uh, complex editing outcomes. We've also uh, done a lot of development to try and uh, approach some of the other problems with unidirectional amplicon sequencing. For example, if users don't know what the potential off-targets are going to be, uh, we can uh, computationally enumerate these based on sequence, sequence similarity of the guide uh, to uh, given a, a genomic sequence. And we do this using a tool called Castle Finder. In addition to try and overcome some of the uh, bias in that may arise from a differential uh, fragment length, we uh, you can incorporate information from unique molecular identifiers, which will help mitigate the effects of um, of PCR amplification bias. And then finally, we uh, try to really st strictly identify uh, a potential translocation or chromosomal alteration sites using um, both the information contained in read one as well as read two. Uh, this is somewhat a complicated, complicated uh, process because read one or read one and read two may not be uh, close to each other. Uh, briefly, I want to um, just show how we were able to use this to analyze um, unidirectional amplicon sequencing from a two-guide editing experiment. And this was performed by collaborators at the Boston Children's Hospital, uh, particularly by uh, uh, members of the, uh, the Dan Bauer lab, uh, particularly Linda Lin, uh, Jin Zhang, and Ann Yun, who um, or using unidirectional amplicon sequencing to uh, study the therapy of sickle cell disease in beta thalassemia. Briefly, if, uh, if the, the system is, there's a, a, a gene called BCL11A, which suppresses fetal hemoglobin. Uh, this gene is controlled by two enhancers that are named plus 55 and plus 58. Um, and the disruption, the disruption of those, uh, the, these enhancers by disrupting the, the GATA1 and TAU1 motifs in these two enhancers can lead to a, a downregulation of BCL11A and upregulation of fetal hemoglobin, which can then help uh, in therape therapeutic approaches for patients suffering from sickle cell or beta thalassemia diseases. So, um, the, uh, so two guides were designed which target these two enhancer regions. The rationale being, if uh, I guess it has been shown that the disruption, I guess if you disrupt one or more of these genes, I guess, um, then you can lead to uh, higher fetal hemoglobin levels. And so we'd like to disrupt as many of these sites as we can. And so if we design two guides to target these sites, um, we can have a, a variety of outcomes. So for example, we can disrupt uh, just the sequence at each individual enhancer location. We could potentially delete the th uh, three kilobase region that's between these two sites, or we could have an inversion. But any of these outcomes will, will uh, technically disrupt these enhancers, which uh, could have therapeutic, uh, could be important for developing therapies for these diseases. So we analyzed a sample where they depleted the number of, um, of, of reads that had the inversion present. And, um, and then we analyze, and we use CRISPR, CRISPR Lungo to analyze this experiment. Um, we did this first using the biased approach, where we took only information that they provided. So we took only the two cut sites, as well as the reads, and we didn't look anywhere else besides these locations. And so in the control sample on the left here, um, we see that the, the majority of the reads support the linear, uh, the linear um, uh, case in which there is no uh, chromosomal alterations here. In the treated, treated example, while there are some reads that show the linear confirmation, we actually also see the uh, the presence of the inversion, which is uh, which is highly present as well. The de the deletion outcome has been depleted in this experiment, but we also see um, a the minority of reads that do show the deletion as well. If we combine this, we the CRISPR, CRISPR Lungo also incorporates the CRISPR-Espresso uh, quantification and, and detailed analysis at each individual site. And so this is these this is output that shows the exact 
uh, genome editing outcomes at each individual site for the linear case. So this is in which A is, is uh, the, the sequence A is followed by sequence B in a linear, in a linear manner. We do see in the control sample, this is the output. The bottom shows the reference sequence here, and the each position we should, each position shows the percentage of nucleotides at each position. Um, in the control sample, basically all the reads are unedited. In the, treat, in the treated sample, we see the characteristic Cas9 genome editing uh, pattern, where these black bars indicate the proportion at each base that have been deleted, and then the brown bars show the percentage of, of, of reads that show an insertion at those locations. And so, we're, so this is, uh, and so when we combine this Crispresso information with the short insertions and deletions with our largest, larger scale, uh, uh, complex editing outcomes, we have a more complete picture. Where on the control we see um, things that are broken down. In blue we have large deletions, uh, either uh, dark meaning that there's no indels, light meaning that there are short indels that are present, short in insertions and deletions that were present. The, the black or gray show large inversions, and then the orange color shows linear uh, linear arrangements with either no indels or with short indels. The control sample shows uh, majority of, of, of uh, reads support the linear, uh, unmodified uh, uh, state with no uh, with no insertions and deletions. However, you can uh, the uh, the treated sample shows a variety of outcomes, including um, short insertions and deletions in the linear conformation, as well as the majority of the reads that show uh, insertions, or the large inversion with a combination of short insertions or um, precise large inversions. We, this is the results from the biased um, uh, output mode. However, we ran this also in the unbiased mode and we're surprised to find actually um, that in addition to cleavage and double strand breaks that were the, the known cut sites where the guides were targeting, we found that there was activity actually at an off target that was 150, base, uh, 150 megabases uh, distal to the plus 25 cut site. And in the control sample, we don't do not, and, and so these uh, outcomes are shown uh, at the, the bottom here. In the control sample, we see no reads that show um, joining of these two regions. However, we see hundreds of reads that actually show uh, joining between um, the on target as well as the off target. And these are important because um, for therapeutic applications, because these are these would be um, an unideal or suboptimal uh, editing outcomes. And minimizing these type of outcomes would be important for um, therapeutic purposes. Briefly, uh, in, in conclusion, we have, uh, I guess, we've shown that CRISPR-Cas9 editing can produce complex editing outcomes that are hard to quantify with standard outcome sequencing. If you use a dual primer approach, you would completely miss these uh, complex editing outcomes. However, CRISPR Lingua is a flexible and powerful tool for characterizing complex genome editing events using single anchor, anchor amplicon sequencing. And lastly, the dual guide editing at the BCL 11A enhancer is effective and it can effectively disrupt these binding sites and the large inversions are a frequent outcome here. With that, I'd like to thank the members of the Pinel Lab and Luca Pinel for my advisor, as well as the members of the Bauer Lab um, for the experimental uh, generation of the data. And with that, I'll flip back to my conclusion slide and take any questions. Questions. Um, the first one, uh, just to understand the method, you basically have a specific oligo, but then you have like a universal adapter that you like to the fragment, basically, right. PCR. Right, it's through tagmentation. So you put the other adapter uh, on. Right. And the second question is, you know, why you, for these um, reads, on map reads after you do all of these, why you need to fragment them? Why you don't just use the entire read with a split aligner like? Like yeah, that's a good question. So we were trying to be highly specific. So um, these other regions or these other aligners, the other split aligners may have some ambiguity as, part, as far as where they transition from one sequence to another sequence. And so by doing this fragmentation approach, we can actually uh, have a little more flexibility and control over where that break happens. I think unlike, so I think, uh, for example, star or other, other alignment approaches, um, uh, it's not exactly known where that cut site occurs, but with Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9, we know where the translocation should occur. And so that's something we can take advantage of if we use this, uh, this fragmentation approach. Because, uh, I don't know what the size of your fragments. At some point, you may map them where they should not be supposed to map. What, what's the size? 
Right, and that's another point. So we, uh, if we fragment it, we can just discover uh, fragments that are not uniquely aligned to the genome and then handle that in our alignment as well. Yeah. Sorry, we started early. Yeah, it's fine. So my only question is, you know, when I'm checking the sort of that, you know, uh, gets uh, due to the register of uh, wrong nutrition. So, you know, this can be driven on the uh, clonal line as well. So, you know, comparing with lines, so my intention is to check those uh, subclonal division or events on the sample or not. Um, sorry, so you're. Uh, um... So, I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, so when we select the clonal some cells and some things can happen in the subclonal culture. And then some during culture, you can see some of the complex events. So are you considering those complex events you know, and consider those events? Uh, right, so uh, let me know if I'm understanding correctly. From what I understand, uh, you're asking about um, spontaneous like uh, chromosomal rearrangements could happen and how we control for those, yeah. So that's another thing. Um, um, when we, when we, uh, yeah, so CRISPR-Cas9 is highly specific to a specific site. And so we can, for example, look at the place where an apparent uh, chimeric read is occurring and see if there's a, a CRISPR off target with some homology to the known guides. And we can then uh, make a hypothesis, we can hypothesize that this either arose kind of due to random chance or because it was, because it has homology to the guide used. Does that make sense? So, um, so we can so so after we enumerate the possible cut sites, we can identify those with homology to the, the guides, and then uh, filter them out this way. That's a good question, though. Okay. It's not just uh, the, the spontaneous chromosomal rearrangements, but also like chimeric reads, which naturally occur in next generation sequencing. So these are both sources of noise that we try to overcome. But yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, Dr. Presentation. Um, so, in the plot in which you showed you the comparison between uh, the uh, control cell and the edited lines, uh, there were a few reads uh, in the control cell that ended up having a deletion and insertion. Right. So, uh, just uh, well, that's something that I expect and I also see my sample. So, what uh, what are are they and uh, at what point does it become a concern that you would like to flag and think that you will see about your sample? Or Right, so uh, we've also looked at these reads, these especially, so these these five reads which do show the deletion, the deletion is at the expected cut site, and so it's kind of hard to interpret what this means. We've also talked to these collaborators to try and figure out exactly what they mean. We have, I mean, we've developed a couple of tests, like for example, you can do a chi-squared test between these numbers, and of course it's obviously highly more, highly significant that it's uh, unlikely, but um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where there's a rising a, a significance test does uh, does allow you to like, kind of ignore them, but I'm not sure exactly where these are these are arising from. It's a good question. Thank you. 